Uh, for those of you just getting connected, welcome and thank you for joining. For those of you who have been listening to my broken record self repeat myself over and over for the last few minutes, uh, thank you guys for being being here early. Uh, excited about today's session. My name is Adam Lemon, and I'm filling in for Danielle Johnson today. She and I work very closely together. Um, we're quite active in the, the Illuminate online community. Um, as is Rachel Shields, and uh, folks were kind of tied up and all over the place uh, today. Danielle's traveling, so she asked me to come and just uh, sort of host and get things started. But I'm not going to be the presenter today. I'm excited to introduce you guys to, to Mike News. Some of you might have uh, heard his voice before. He's one of our principal strategy consultants, and he's been working with nonprofits for a long time to help them with all of the things that they're doing online. Um, so without further ado, uh, Mike, you should have control of the, the slides. We are recording, and I'm just going to kind of let you take it away. Um, Mike, if you need me to do anything, just chime right in. I'm, I'm uh, right here. Uh, I guess last thing I'll mention is you guys can type in questions as we go. Uh, Mike mentions that he will be fielding questions at the end, and so if I need to interrupt him uh, in mid-flow, I, I can, but uh, Mike, with that, we'll let you uh, take it away, and then we'll, we'll touch base again at the end. Great. Thanks so much, Adam, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to spend a little bit of time with us to learn a little bit more about how nonprofits are using SEO. I, I think it's a really uh, important topic and a topic that doesn't really get the attention it deserves, although with the recent... Google algorithm change, I think it has brought a little bit more attention to an area that I, I feel is really underutilized by nonprofit organizations. So uh, as Adam mentioned, I, I've been uh, at BlackBot a long time, I think uh, over eight years now. Before that, I worked in the nonprofit world uh, doing online fundraising and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and kind of everything in between. So uh, a little bit about me, I'm originally from, from Buffalo, I'm a past BlackBot customer, I uh, enjoy heist movies, college troops and blog uh, every month or two at NP Engage. You can find my blog post there, and, and on Twitter you can find me at Mike Snooze. Uh, so, so what I do on a regular basis is I do work with nonprofits on their SEO uh, strategy and tactics and, and next steps and where they should really focus their efforts. I also work with them on their email campaigns, social media campaigns, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns, so kind of everything from a digital fundraising and marketing perspective. And, and as I mentioned, this is really an area that when, when organizations do give it a little bit of time and attention, uh, we, we see them, uh, we see the results follow, and, and I'll share some of those examples within today's webinar. So I'm excited that you're here and ready to get started. So let's jump right into things. What we're going to cover during today's agenda is I feel like I have to cover a little bit about, about what was called mobile get-in and, and Google's algorithm update. So I'll touch on that. If, if you didn't read up uh, extensively on it, I'll give you kind of the highlights and, and what you need to know. But then we'll, we'll jump into some things related specifically and in, in going beyond mobile get-in and, and how nonprofits are using SEO and, and what role does it play in the daily responsibilities of somebody who is a fundraiser, who's a... Uh, online communication person at an organization, and, and probably you're, you're juggling multiple hats. So between a website and email and social media and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, SEO is, is probably that thing that you want to get to, but there just aren't enough hours in the day and enough days in the week to actually, to actually make an impact and, and spend some time with SEO. And I'll also give you then five things to focus on. So as I'll, I'll reiterate through today's webinar, SEO is kind of its own world. It's its own industry. It's, it's huge. It's, a, it's an important driver for companies and businesses and, and nonprofit organizations. And typically you'll see that at least half of the traffic on a website comes from search engines, if, if not much more. So I'll, I'll kind of uh, sift through all of the information that's out there. Uh, a lot of it can be uh, a bit technical and, and um, difficult to understand where to prioritize your efforts as a nonprofit. If you just have a small amount of time, what should you really do to get the biggest impact? So we'll talk about five things that from working with organizations that I've found uh, help to focus on to really, to really get you at least moving with SEO and, and see some results. So what role does SEO play in online giving? When I work with an organization, inevitably the, the initial conversation comes back to what their goal is from an online perspective. They want to raise more money online. So that, that's usually the first thing out of, the, out of their mouth, if, if not uh, shortly after. So that's the ultimate goal, right? And, and to get to that goal, there are, are several steps. 
And to raise more online, in addition to having a, a very good email program, at, at times you need to increase your, your email subscribers because as the latest MNR benchmark report has shown, nonprofits are losing email subscribers faster than they're acquiring them. So by the end of the year, many nonprofits have less email subscribers due to churn, due to unsubscribe, spam reports, emails going bad. So you need to increase your subscribers to raise more money online. And if you want to increase your subscribers, you need to increase your website traffic. So acquiring email subscribers, sure, there's ways to do it at, at, at different events that you have and as people call into your office and all of these other ways to, to acquire email addresses, but the, the strongest way is through your website, through your uh, online form that you have set up. Uh, hopefully it's on your homepage. Hopefully it's, there's, a, there's a field or a, a few fields where people can sign up to become an email subscriber. So when you do get traffic to your website, you're converting them to a subscriber so you can control the conversation, develop the relationship, and not just hope that they're going to come back to your website. So in order to increase website traffic, the really one of the underutilized ways to do this is to have better SEO. As I mentioned, SEO and, and search engine traffic uh, result in, in a uh, at least the at least half, if not more, of the traffic you're getting to your site. If you improve your SEO, you'll get more people to your site. You'll not only get more people to your site, you'll get the right kind of people who are interested in your programs, in your mission in what you're doing that want to get involved because they're looking for something mission specific, but maybe they don't know your organization yet. So you're, you're going to increase traffic and you're going to increase quality traffic to your site. So if you're not sure what search engine optimization is or, or as it's known SEO, let me, let me show you a search results page and kind of break it down a little bit for you. When we look at a search results page, the highlighted area in green is paid ads that you see that um, uh, different different businesses or companies or even nonprofits will pay to show up in, in these slots, and it's based on a bidding system. And we're, we're not going to cover um, pay-per-click as it's known today, but it's, it's an important part of uh, some organizations. This is where if you've heard of getting a Google grant to get free advertising and get, get free paid advertising, this is where it would come into play. Although that, that is a, a topic that I, I think um, is, is another area that uh, I think nonprofits could, could use some guidance on in terms of, okay, great, I, I have a Google grant, now what do I do with it? So that green area is the paid area of a search engine results page. In gray, this is starting to get into the organic search results, the natural search results, sometimes they're called, where this is where we're talking about how do we get into these rankings, how do I get my page to appear for our particular service or program or whatever it is. This is what has been around for a long time and, and you're, you're used to seeing this and, and probably you, you, you take a look at the first few results and, and those are the ones that you, you typically click on. What has crept into search results more the past couple of years is what's highlighted in blue. And I'll talk about this more a little bit later, but these are local search results where often if you're looking for uh, a pizza place or something in your area, um, they're going to show you pizza places near where you're located. They're not going to show you the best pizza places in the country. They're going to show you what's relevant to you. And these local search results have become really important, especially for nonprofits over the past couple of years as they've gained more real estate within the search engine results page. And why is this important? Well, it's important to get into this, this first page or so because 75% of users never scroll uh, beyond the first page of, of search results. They stick really to this first page. So if you're ranking 25th, 30th, 15th even, you know, you're, you're probably not getting as much traffic as if you were in the top 10 and if, if you were in the top 5. That's a quick overview on what search engine optimization is. We all heard, or I think most of us heard back in April, mobile get in, and there was so much written about this, and there was so much talk. And in a way, if you saw the blog post I had in the, in the Luminate community, this was a good thing for nonprofits because it forced them to actually take a closer look at how their pages are ranking and figure out, okay, well, what do we rank well for? How are we doing with SEO? It brought attention to the topic, 
um, if, if your website wasn't mobile friendly, then it you know that that may be something that that wasn't as positive for you. But, but overall, I, th I think this was a good thing for nonprofits because it it forced them to pay attention to search engine results and SEO. And, and this mobile get an update was really about a better user experience for mobile search visitors. So um, the announcement that came through uh, this was this was Google's announcement, and, and basically to summarize it, it said as more people use mobile devices, our algorithms have to adapt. Starting April 21st, we will be expanding our use mobile friendliness as a ranking signal. This change will have a significant impact in our search results. Okay, so when this announcement came out, this caused a lot of communication, a lot of speculation, just, just a lot of conversations going on around search results and, and SEO. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into every little detail about it. I'm gonna summarize it here for you in a moment, but um, I would encourage you to visit our, our blog post or our blog NP Engage. And my colleague Scott Gilman had a fantastic article shortly after um, Mobile Get and Happen on what Google's new algorithm really means for your nonprofit. There's a difference between understanding its impact on companies and businesses, which is what most things out there wrote about, uh, big companies, businesses, how it impacts them, versus how it impacts the nonprofit. A nonprofit staff, and I know this from, from working at my, my former organization, is different from a company. Um, there is less resources, there is less staff, so if, if you're trying to make sense of the algorithm update from, from everything that's out there, it's going to be difficult to kind of make sense and, and figure out and pare down, well, how does this apply to our particular organization? So Scott's uh, blog post did a really good job of that. So you can find that at npengage.com. But some of the highlights were that so Google wants to direct mobile searchers to relevant mobile-friendly pages. Really, it's about the user experience as somebody searches on a mobile device, Google wants them to have a, a very good experience. That includes taking them to a mobile-friendly page. So as much as this was about, hey, is your so site mobile-friendly or not, really the question was, is your site, how is your user experience for mobile visitors? What kind of experience are they going to have? And, and that's something that goes beyond just having a mobile-friendly page. That's something that really gets into, if, if I'm somebody new who's coming to your site from search, which is, is usually what happens from search engines. Um, what, what kind of experience can I have on a mobile device to really interact with your organization, understand it, and, and um, be able to, to find different content on your website? So a couple things. Mobile friendliness is determined page by page, not by the entire site. So we've seen some organizations where their home page is mobile friendly, but some of the internal pages are not mobile friendly. So just because one page is not mobile friendly doesn't mean that the entire site is not mobile friendly. Uh, mobile friendliness right now only affects mobile search engine result pages. So if you're searching from your desktop, um, it, it's not going to affect the search results on that desktop search results page, though there has been speculation by people within the SEO industry that mobile friendliness and, and user experience is going to become more and more of a factor that eventually will be will be recognized as a ranking factor. Uh, mobile friendly pages will be tagged in the results for now. So you may see when you search on your mobile device that as you look at pages, some of them do say mobile friendly. So that can actually impact click throughs and click throughs to to particular pages and influence which pages get, get clicked on in search results. And content is so important. So this was a big piece of Scott uh, Gilman's blog that content is still important. Non-mobile friendly pages can still outrank mobile pages if, if the content is better, if it's more applicable to this search term and to where this person is located. Non-mobile friendly pages can still outrank mobile pages. Okay? So an example may be the name of your organization. Um, if, if somebody searches for that name, you may still show up number one on a mobile device even though your home page may not be mobile friendly just because your home page and your website is more relevant to that particular phrase than other web pages that are out there. So do I need to take this seriously? Well, a few things. You can you can use Google's mobile tester, and if you just Google that phrase, you'll you'll find it uh, on your home page to see if you pass the mobile friendly test. Uh, most of the traffic, or it, it, I, I guess we can say the the top page, usually a better way to say it would be 
the top page on nonprofit websites that drives the most search traffic is always the home page. So how is your home page doing? Is that mobile friendly? That would be a good place to start and then view some of the other top pages to see how are your top pages in terms of being mobile friendly. Google Analytics will help you do that to see which are your top pages, how many mobile visitors are you getting, which pages they're landing on. And if you didn't see on NP Engage earlier this year, there was research that our team conducted that did find that from a donation form perspective, there is a 34% increase for mobile friendly donation forms. Um, not that people are necessarily finding your donation form from search engines. They're not necessarily looking for a mission and your donation form pops up and they visit it. They, they're going to see your, your main website, your home page, maybe an internal page. They're going to find you that way and hopefully there's a good user experience where they navigate to your donation form. Uh, but having mobile friendly donation forms uh, helps within the conversion rate for that form. So this was my point of if you, if you saw the, the pre-webinar blog post within the community, Google's mobile update helped nonprofits focus on search traffic. But from working with organizations, most nonprofits aren't very good at SEO because they simply don't have the time or the expertise to really spend, I mean, in a way, it, 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 you, know, you, could, you could devote a, a good chunk of your time or of somebody's time just to SEO, and there, as I mentioned earlier, there are other digital priorities. This is what I typically see from working with maybe 25 organizations or so the past couple of years. Typically, when we look at their search engine rankings and, and how much traffic they're getting to their site, um, we see that they rank well, of course, for their name. And most of their search traffic comes through from people who know who they are and they search for their name rather than putting in the website address of your organization. So that, that's typical. But traffic from mission-related phrases, and in this case it was a, a cancer organization, traffic from mission-related phrases is much lower. The clicks coming from phrases that people might use who don't know your organization, but they're looking for something mission-related, that's often much lower. And in addition to this, if, if you don't know what you rank well for, this is something that is available for free. This is available through, it used to be called Google Webmaster Tools. Um, they changed it recently to, to call it Google Search Council, so you might see that if, if you look for it. Um, but this is information that, that used to be available more so in Google Analytics a couple years ago until they, they stopped showing you what people were searching for. And that information moved over to Google Webmaster Tools and, and now called Google Search Council. So a good first step would be if you, if you don't know what you rank well for, what you drive traffic to your site, and, and what you don't rank well for, and, and what doesn't drive traffic to your site, that would be the first place that I would look to get that set up to, to take a look at traffic throughout your website. Um, there's a, a pretty easy way that you can just put a little piece of code onto your home page and then verify that that's your website, and then you have access. It, it gives you the past three months worth of search traffic and search rankings to understand, okay, where are we at today? So you can then plan a little bit more about how do we move forward. So some of the, some of the other things that relate to how nonprofits uh, use SEO and how they incorporate it into their planning. So from, from talking with organizations, most know that it's important. They know that it's something that they should be doing that they want to get to. But they may not have the expertise. As I mentioned, it's, it's kind of its own world. I'll show you an example in a second. Um, and, and many may only rank well for the name. I mean, unless you're a, a large, uh, large, large organization, maybe a national organization that has a, a significant digital team that somebody can, can really focus on this, um, you know, there just isn't the time to, to devote to it. So SEO, but, but organizations know that SEO is needed to increase traffic and traffic will lead to subscribers, which will lead to donations. So to give you an example of search ranking factors, so, so they can change often, as was evident with mobile get-in, as was evident in the past couple of years, how social activity has become a much more important factor in how a page gets ranked. That, that's become much more prominent in the past couple of years. Um, things can be technical. You can get into things such as phrases like schema and, and other phrases that 
you, you almost need time just to read up on that, and it's very technical to do some of these things. So that, that can be a, something that, that um, hinders nonprofits from being able to, to dig into to SEO. And then, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of just overwhelming that this huge industry that can help you, but, but understanding it and, and figuring out what makes sense for you can be difficult. So this is an example of uh, what a, a company search metrics what their ranking factors were for 2013. And I'll get into this in a little bit, but, but some of the important ranking factors that were new in 2013 were the activity of social activity of a page, so how many, how many Facebook shares and likes. But I, I show you this big chart, not so you can read through every one and, and try, to, try to get something from this chart, but just to show you this was 2013, and in 2014, it changed to to this, where it was no longer back in 2013. Google Plus Ones were at the top of the list, and in 2014, it was the click-through rate of your page that was at the top of the list. So things can change, and there's new ranking factors that come in. This is because, as you see, in the algorithm uh, from Google and, and from other search engines updates on a regular basis, so it's evolving. It, it's never static. Um, so, so there's a lot that goes into this, right? So let, let's get into, from a nonprofit perspective, all of these search ranking factors. Which one makes, makes the most sense for nonprofits um, based on, on having limited time, limited staff, and maybe limited expertise with some of the things that you can do? The first area to focus on, and, and this is usually um, a quick win for organizations, but improving the browser title of your your pages. And what is a browser title? Well, if we're looking at a page like this, and this is in, in Firefox, um, at the top of the, of the page, and, and this is a little bit older version of Firefox, you, you may still have this, but where the arrow is pointing where it says Adoption, Lutheran Child and Family Services of Illinois, that is the browser title. Uh, if you're on a more recent version or on a different uh, browser altogether, maybe you're using Chrome or, or Internet Explorer, it's what appears in the tab here. So, so in the tab, you started to see that it says adoption, Lutheran child, and, and so on and so on. This is one of the top places search engines look on your pages for what words are important. Um, you may have heard a lot of different things from um, keywords to headings to images. Um, this is this is right up there. This is this is probably the top place that search engines look to understand what your page is about. In addition to a number of other things on your page and and the whole algorithm that that uh, it, it it takes into account. This is one of the big things you can do. So, what are some examples of some opportunities missed from a browser title? Here's one from a school that their homepage they just list the name of their school. Doesn't tell you additional information about where they're located, what type of school it is, uh, what they specialize in, anything else. It just has the name. So when people search by their name, they're going to find this website. But if I'm looking for a, um, a, a, a high school in my town, and this, this school is located in my town, um, I, I may not find it as, as well as I find other schools that, that tell me a little bit more about their school. Another example, sometimes they'll see organizations on their homepage. They'll use the word home, and then they'll use the name of their organization. Um, in this case, you know, people probably are not searching for the name of your organization and the word home or homepage. Um, they're not going to search by that. So uh, using a, a more relevant phrase that, that talks about your mission, because this is not only seen in the, in the browser title here by search engines, it's also seen in search results when people – um, search for a phrase, the browser title is what's going to appear. So a couple of better examples of, of using the browser title. Um, Catholic Charities of St. Paul, Minneapolis, they have housing, meals, and shelter. So it tells you exactly what they do succinctly in case people are searching for those phrases in that area. Student Sponsor Partners, an organization that uh, helps connect high school students with mentors in New York City. Simply, they use Mentoring New York City. Uh, and of a school here in Richmond, Virginia, they use Collegiate K-12 Private School in Richmond, Virginia. Somebody searching for K-12 or private school, that gives them a better chance of showing up. 
so I mentioned that that these browser titles are not only there in the browser, but it's often in search results that you see these these uh, browser titles. And here's an example: if I'm looking at a search results page, the browser title appears there where it says Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden, and then it goes into whatever the page is about. So not only is it important to use words that are relevant to that page, um, but it's also important to front load them. In this case, if they used portrait and photography and then said the name of their organization, that would be much more effective. And, and when we worked with them, this was one of the things that, that we um, recommended to change and they did change, that they front loaded their browser titles with the most important phrase or phrases of whatever that page was about. Often if you look at the, the heading of your web page, um, so if it's a page on, on volunteering, probably at the top of the page there's a heading that says volunteering. A, a good browser title there would be volunteer to use at the beginning and then put your name after that. Here's an example of one organization that did this. So um, World Federation of Hemophilia, uh, we worked with them and they uh, had an event page that, that wasn't really showing up on the first page of search results for an important event that they had back in 2014. And after they, they really what they did mostly is just reconfigured their browser title. And after the browser title updates, um, they went from ranking t between 20th and 30th to ranking first to second. And their search visits per month increased 44%. So I, I just have uh, I see one question here just just caught my eye. What is SEO? If you're a little late to the to the webinar, it is it stands for search engine optimization and basically getting your pages ranked better in search results when you when you Google something when you search through Bing or or another search engine um, coming up higher in search results so people will visit your website and and, and it increases traffic to your site. The second area to focus on is keyword research. And so knowing what words to use in those browser titles comes back a little bit and to people, um, how people search and the keywords that they actually use. So if you're using a phrase in your browser title that people just don't search by or they don't search by much, um, it, it could be a missed opportunity instead of using a word that, that is searched. I'm going to show you an example here. Um, here's an organization that we worked with, a, a cancer organization. And when we did keyword research for them, we found that on their website they were using, and, and not to get too specific, um, to, to give away um, the, the organization, but they were using very general cancer type phrases on their site. So for, I guess think of it as regions of the body rather than specific um, parts of the body. And, and when we did the keyword research, we found that, you know, the general cancer types, people don't search by as much. If you look at the top chart in, in blue, the general cancer type, or one of the ones that they were using, had 5,400 monthly searches. But a specific cancer type within that region had a much higher number of monthly searches. Um, I, if my math is right, I think that's 15% higher. So one of our recommendations and what the research showed us was that we need to focus on, on specific types of cancer throughout the site more than just general types of cancer. Another example below also found that um, this is something that you can, you can get through Google's keyword tool, which is used for um, paid ads and, and paid uh, search, search ads that show up. Um, but it also can be used just to, to research what phrases people actually search by. And one of the things that we found with them was that, listen, we need to, we need to use specific types of cancer much more in our page titles and, and throughout our different pages because that's going to help you to rank better for those specific types of, of cancer. And that's ultimately going to drive more traffic to your website. So where do you use those words? Well, when, when, you, when you figure out which words people search by, you want to use them in a number of important places. So as I mentioned, and I talked about the browser title, the page URL, content, copy, the heading, image, alt text, these are all places that, that you can use those keywords. Um, you want to use them naturally in your content. You don't want to write for search engines and, and kind of stuff these keywords on a page. Um, Google, Google uh, catches on to that. They penalize for that. 
And, and one of the things that, that has become more important in how you get ranked is the user experience. So you want to have content that is written for your audience first, um, but using these keywords in these important places naturally w will help. And it's not necessarily, you know, this is, this is another way that search engine optimization has changed. It's not necessarily that you want to match up one keyword specifically for one landing page. Um, Google, Google knows words that are related to maybe that specific type of cancer. So it's using phrases that are related to whatever, whatever phrase you're, you're trying to optimize a page for, related phrases, similar phrases. Um, it used to be that, that you would just have one keyword per page, but it, it, it's trending more and more now um, as algorithms update that it, it can be other related phrases as well that you would want to put onto the page and, and you know, that would be relevant for whatever topic it is that you're talking about. Number three is to, what to focus on number three is to improve local search. And this is if your organization is uh, regionally based. If you're not a national organization, meaning you don't attract whatever service you provide, whatever your mission is related to, if you focus on your region more than nationally or globally, this is for you, and, and this is very important for you because really, for a lot of these phrases, you're no longer competing for search results nationally. You're competing for search results in your region or in your city, which gives you a better chance if you do things um, uh, correctly that, that will help your local search. So what do I mean by local SEO? Um, I, I mentioned this early on, but, but I'll, I'll show you another example here. If I'm looking at high schools in my area and I search, Google is going to detect my location. Um, and, and by detecting my location, it's going to show me high schools in my area instead of high schools that are the best high schools in the country. It's going to show me what's near me. So as I look into the, to the organic search results, sure, the first one is the best high schools in uh, a U.S. News & World Report, but the second search result is for a school that is with in my neighborhood, within my community, nearby. It's showing me search results of things that are nearby. Um, it goes on to show me additional local search results that kind of invade the search results page and take up this prime real estate. It shows me different high schools, and then it shows me where they're located on a specific map. So it's, it's the search results when you're, when you're looking for something in your area, such as a pizza, a high school, a place to volunteer, a cancer center, an animal shelter, a place to adopt animals, a hospice organization. Local SEO is going to impact what comes up and which websites get the traffic. And if I'm using a mobile device, it's even, it's even more localized. So if I do the same search on my mobile device, I see that um, the other search results have been taken away, the U.S. News and World Report, the other a uh, couple of, of results, and it goes right to the map, and it shows me the local high schools. So how could your nonprofit take advantage of local SEO? Well, for local SEO, the rules are different than what you may have heard for SEO uh, traditionally. So, you know, you may have heard some things like link building and um, improving your pages. Local SEO, there's different rules to play by. And I'm going to give you a few of the top ones here. One is, number one, if you haven't claimed your Google Plus page, um, you, should, you should go do that today. That, that's important. You won't be able to, to confirm it um, today, likely. Often they, they send you, if you say that you want to you uh, claim this page, they'll send you a postcard at your specific address. But it's important to claim your Google Plus page, even if you're not using Google Plus as a social media platform that you're going to be posting on, that you're going to be um, adding to the social media mix, it's important to claim your Google Plus page. Um, one reason is because then you can, you can update the categories that are on the page. The categories have been shown when, when, um, when, when uh, researchers and, and SEO professionals are surveyed for what are the important local factors. Categories have shown at the top of the list uh, for the last year or two. If you update your categories, and, and Google has these preset categories that you can choose from, but sometimes I'll see organizations that on their Google Plus page, 
they'll just say that they're a nonprofit organization when actually they're an animal shelter and they should be using the category animal shelter and um, other animal related phrases that are, are available. You can use up to nine Google categories on your page. Um, so taking a look and, and if you have just the category of nonprofit organization, if there's other categories that are applicable to what it is that, that you do as an organization, then add those other categories. And that, that's something that if you've already claimed your page, you can go and do today and, and update. Citations are another biggie when it comes to how your pages get ranked locally. So a citation is simply a consistent name, address, and phone number on uh, different web pages where your organization's name appears. So in this example, on the organization's Bing page, versus a site called City Search, the, the phrase center was abbreviated. That was off. Um, so that, that hurts their citations. There's, um, in, terms of, in terms of pages that you, you want to make sure this is consistent, there, there are some pages that are more important than others. Number one, your Google Plus page and how your name, address, and phone number appears, that should match what the address is on your website, on your home page. Usually in your footer, you'll have a mailing address. Those should match. The exception being if you're an organization that has multiple locations, um, then, then it, it shouldn't necessarily match what's on your home page, but it should match what's on your website when you list your different locations, the name of your organization, the mailing address, city, state, zip included, and phone number should match. Um, other popular sites include Yelp and Yahoo and a couple of the ones that we see here, Bing and City Search. And there's some other sites that search engines pay attention to more that aren't necessarily ones that, that you may have heard of. Um, so if you actually, a, a place that you can, a tool that you can use to see how you're doing with your citations rather than, than trying to find a tool out there, if you go to moz.com slash tools, that's a place where you can actually see, uh, there's a tour where you can see your, your local citations, your, your local factors, and it'll let you put in for free your name, address, and phone number, and it will show you out of the important places on the internet, maybe the top 30 pages or so that search engines look, they'll, they'll tell you and they'll show you which ones are incorrect, which ones have the wrong phone number, which ones have the wrong address. And that can be a quick win to update to help your local search engine rankings um, and, and how you show up when people search in your, in your city and in your region. Another thing that you can do if you're a local organization, and this is another thing we, we recommend at the Daniel Stowe Botanical Gardens, was to add the location in your browser title at the end of it. And, and really for not only your, uh, I would say your top pages definitely, but also, you, you often can just do this throughout your website with content management tools. They let you put in what you want to appear in your browser title throughout the site. And so using the name of your organization at the end of the browser title followed by your city and state, that will help Google believe that you're actually located in your city and state. That will help to confirm that you're located in that, in that area so it will add to the credibility you have in that area and it will help your local rankings in search results. Um, as, you, as you think about adding this, if you're an organization that's just on the outskirts of a major city, you have to put the city that you're located in. So if you're in a suburb of Chicago, you actually have to put that suburb, comma, Illinois. You can't, can't really cheat the system and say that you're in Chicago. This was the case with Daniel Bestoga, uh, Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden. They're in Belmont, North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte. So they had to put in that uh, they're in Belmont. But, but that helps. That helps Google know exactly where you're located. So as people search in Charlotte and in their town, they're going to know that it's a close place that they can, they can show search results if you're looking for a wedding venue or a, a business rental or just something to do um, in that area for fun. Another thing that's important is online reviews. So this is something that, that probably takes a little bit longer and also has a wider reach than just SEO. 
So having good online reviews, if you're an animal shelter, if you're a hospice organization, if you're a hospital, whatever it is, um, that's going to give people more confidence in your website and in your web page when they see you in search results. So we see here for different animal organizations in Louisiana, we see that the, the search results actually show your Google Plus reviews, how many you have and what those ratings are. So getting more reviews and getting a plan in place to ask people to review you. Google Plus is very important. If you can get them to review you on Google Plus, that's important. Also sites like Yelp, um, other review sites that may be specific to your organization or your school help as well. Um, the more online reviews you get and the better online reviews you get, the more that Google and other search engines are going to say, okay, this is a, this is a site that, that is well received that people like going to, so um, that's going to help you with your search engine rankings. The fourth item to focus on, and, and this is something I've mentioned a couple times, and this is new, is social activity. So as I showed a little bit earlier, the top search ranking factors for 2014, if you look at the top 10, look at what is in there. Not only the Google Plus ones, so on, a, on someone's Google account, if they plus one your page, but if you get Facebook shares, if you get Facebook comments, you get Facebook likes, if you get tweets, if, if you get pins, these are all things that help to impact the rankings of your pages. So as you're putting together your social activity and you're thinking about what to post, it's good to mix in pages that you, that you want to rank better for. And, and sure, you want to rank better for all of your pages, but prioritizing, hey, what are the pages that send people to our, our programs, our specific services? What do we need to get better on? and incorporating these into your social activity and your social postings. Here's an example for Louisiana SPCA. And when they post this page, the more that it gets clicked here and the more that it gets liked and shared and commented, the better that is for search engine results for this particular page and for its ranking. Okay. Um, and, and one more word about social activity. As you, as you think about what to post and um, how you post the, the different pages on the site. Um, having, having it, it visible as, as somebody is seeing this post, um, it, it helps to have that URL visible in the initial post. So sometimes in a Facebook post, you have to click more and you have to go down and you have to actually get the URL. So using it a little bit earlier on, um, because if, if, if you actually saw what the top ranking factor was in 2014, um, and it's actually cut off on this slide, but back in the beginning, if, if you saw it, it was click-throughs. So the more that your page gets a click-through um, in social activity and also in search results, that's going to help the rankings of that page, and that leads us to number five. And number five is a meta description, and, and you may have heard some of these phrases, meta description, meta tags, meta keywords. Uh, meta keywords, by the way, are something that is really no longer that relevant. Um, people, people tried stuffing them uh, over, over the past several years and putting all kinds of words in there. And at, at, at one point, Google just said, you know what, we're not going to pay attention to your meta keywords anymore and how they, how they factor into rankings. So that one, it, it's used, I think, still by, by Bing and Yahoo, but it's not as relevant. But a meta description, and, and if we go back to here is, here is what I was just talking about a little bit, the top ranking factor in how pages get ranked is the click-through rate of that page. So when a page appears in search results, how often does it get clicked? And one of the ways that you can help with how pages get clicked is to add a meta description to your top pages. So a meta description in these couple of examples, if we look at um, the home page, for this organization. The meta description that shows in search results says that Bay Area Legal Aid is offering clinics to assist students who attended the now closed Corinthian colleges, including, um, and it goes on to say some other things. That description isn't really indicative and doesn't really highlight everything that this organization does. Um, when, when somebody sees their homepage in search results, there's a lot more to this organization, how they provide legal services for the underprivileged in the San Francisco area. If you don't have a meta description on your top pages, 
Google is just going to pull something from the page randomly and show that as your description in search results, which is highlighted here in, in green. So in this case, they didn't have a meta description, so Google just went in and it found a phrase, and that's what's shown as the, the description of the page. And it's not really relevant, it's not really as interesting as something that might highlight all of the great things that the organization does. So as a result, their click-through may be lower because people see this in search results and it, it, you know, they, they say, well, you know what, I, I'm not a student, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not really interested in clinics, this isn't relevant to me, I'm going to go on to the next search result. The other thing about meta descriptions is that when a page is shared on social media, that's the description of the page that's going to be shown. So when I share this page on Facebook, you see at the bottom, the bottom uh, green box, it, it shows that description. And if I'm seeing this on social media, this may not interest me enough to click through versus if there was something that was relevant, highlighting, interesting, um, then I might be more likely to click through to this page when I see it on social media and when I see it in search results. So adding meta descriptions at least to your top pages, to your home page, to the top 10 or 15 or 20 pages that drive traffic, um, because probably your, your competitors, your, your nonprofits that compete for traffic in your area um, and, and nationally even, they, they probably haven't done this either. So this is a way to get a leg up on some of the other organizations that will appear. Okay, so we're going to wrap up today's webinar with just a couple of examples. And, and so does SEO work for nonprofits? One of the organizations I showed in here, Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden, some of the things that we did with them with their page titles, with their local SEO, helped them to increase, and I think this was over a nine-month period, year over year, from 29,000 search engine visitors to 92,000. Another organization, a national organization, through better keyword research and browser titles, uh, National Pancreas Foundation, they saw their traffic increase 120,000 search visitors to 286. And then uh, ICA, uh, they saw their search traffic from 367,000 to 707,000. So if you think about getting this many more people to your website and converting X number of them to subscribers and then having the ability to email them and uh, develop a relationship and convert them to donors, um, that that's a that's a way that you can you can boost your online giving, um, but it starts with this first step. So I'll just say real quick that that our team does offer an SEO assistance service where um, if, if you don't have time to do the research, we'll do the keyword research for you. We'll take a look and and specify what those missed SEO opportunities are and specific actions to take as well uh, within local SEO, within browser titles, within meta descriptions, and other areas that weren't mentioned on this webinar. So that's what I have for you today. I hope you found this helpful. Um, we're going to go and take questions. Um, yeah. We and also, oh, go ahead, Adam. I'll, I'll let yeah, you Yeah, I was going to say, my, yeah, this is Adam, so thank you all for typing in some questions. You know, there were a handful of questions coming in during that that I was able to kind of chime in and answer, and, and I'll just go ahead and take this last, this latest question as well and kind of chime in as a similar answer to something I mentioned earlier. Um, Several of you were asking questions about in Page Builder and Luminate Online. And when you are in the back end of Page Builder, one of the little nuanced things that you just have to get your, your head wrapped around, and those of you who have used it a lot kind of know exactly what I'm talking about, you know, there is a difference between editing attributes of the actual page itself in Page Builder and then versus clicking to manage the versions of that page. And then whenever you're managing the versions, when you look at next to each version, there will be this little link there that says edit version attributes. So it's just kind of important for you to be zoomed in on which level of the page you're looking at. Uh, and then Megan, to answer this, this recent question you said of, well, can you, is there a place to actually set meta tags with, within Page Builder? And there is. Um, and it's when you're uh, creating a new version, you'll have a chance to give page title and then also meta, uh, page meta tags or, or meta description. And then um, if, you've, if you're dealing with a version that's already in place, you just click to edit those, those attribute versions. So, Mike, I think I was able to answer some of the other similar questions to that because it was Luminate Online related. Sure. But um, sure. working backwards, it kind of uh, – I guess maybe we should just go from the top of the list down because the first couple of questions that came in I thought would be good for you to speak to um, yep. 
Let's see. What was the? Do you see the list of questions there, Mike, or do you need me to read them I, out? I, I do. Yeah. And the the first one that I haven't answered yet looks like it was from Jackie mm -hmm. uh, about what did WFH change in its browser title. And really, Jackie, what they did is they they front loaded it more. They had their the name of their um, organization first rather than the name of the event and some of the other relevant phrases. So they, they changed that one page really. One of the biggest things was to, to front load it with the name of the event. With um, it was I, I can't recall what the name was, but it was a name that was synonymous with other terms people may search by. So it wasn't a, a unique event that, that they automatically just ranked first for. They had to do a little bit of work. And they front loaded that browser title and, and saw better results with it, together with, with just highlighting the name of the event in the heading on the page, in the image, uh, alt text, in, in some of the copy as well, making some of those updates. Okay. I see there's also a um, question from Pushpa. I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, is it important to have browser titles for each and every page on the website or only? important key pages? And my answer would be for every page. Um, you, you often don't know when you're creating a page if it's going to rank well in search engine results. Uh, many of them won't. Many of them are, are phrases people won't search by, but some of them are phrases that, and when I, when I work with organizations, they're often surprised that they say, oh my gosh, we rank well for that. That's really interesting. And, and they had no idea that that phrase or that page was driving traffic to their site. So I would I would do it for every single page um, as you're as you're creating a page as Adam said putting in that that browser title it's also sometimes called a page title um, that is something that that I would take the couple of minutes and and even if you haven't done research on it just putting something in depending what content management system you're doing that they'll sometimes automatically do this for you based on the name of the page but I, I would definitely make sure that that is something that is is added in always. Okay, and I'm looking through here, um, Adam, and it looks like there were a couple questions specific to, to Illuminate, and I'm going to keep going down through here. Um, there's a question on what was the what was the local search results tool, and it looks like somebody typed in maz.com, um, maz.com maz tools, and I, I do apologize, I may have the the uh, a slight. Uh, Buffalo accent that that makes everything into an A. So I, I do apologize if it came off that way. It's actually moz.com. You're you're close. So uh, it's moz.com/tools. And on that page, you'll see something that says Moz Local. There's a, there's probably maybe eight or twelve different things you can click on, and it's it's Moz Local. And that will actually let you put in your name and zip code. And that free tool will let you see where online that um, your, your name, address, and phone number are inconsistent with other important pages. It'll show you which ones you're doing well, but it also just simply lists uh, five or 10 or 15 pages, and it'll say your phone number is inconsistent here, your mailing address is inconsistent here. So these are some quick wins, things that you can do over the next week or two to get these uh, corrected. Uh, it, it's also known as a citation but making sure the name, address, and phone number is consistent. And, and really, everything should match your Google Plus page. So it's another reason if you have not claimed your Google Plus page to go and claim it so you can make sure that the address and phone number and name is consistent with everything else. But really, Google goes back and it looks at what's on your Google Plus page, and then it compares everything else to that to see what is inconsistent. Cool. Yeah, you know, the next question on that list, Mike, was uh, in. Re it's kind of hard to see the context, but there was a question um, uh, about do Bitly a links uh, do Bitly links affect this question mark? And what Megan was referring to there was that you had kind of uh, at a point in the presentation you you worked your way backwards to something you had mentioned about click throughs being such an, uh, an effective or such a heavily measured part of what affects your ranking. And, and so then the, that question popped up in context of that saying, oh, well, so what if I were to have some bit.ly links and lots of people were clicking those bit.ly links, does that, does that traffic end up impacting the, the search engine optimization the same way? Or I guess the, the 
if they don't affect it, is that you know, is that only click-through traffic from a search engine search? Yeah, it's Megan. It's a great question, and I I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I, I could. It's really a, a well thought out question. Um, if if you're putting, as Adam said, a Bitly link instead of the actual URL of the um, of the of the um, of the page that you want people to go to, um, I'd be happy to take that offline and and follow up with. Uh, within the community, I, I think it's a great question and a worthwhile thing to look up. I, I do believe I saw, I can't recall if it was maybe a year or two ago, where there was there was some, and this was independent of SEO, but a, a report where people clicked less on Bitly links versus the actual website address. I, I don't know if that's current. I know that was uh, something that caught my eye a year or two ago. But but thanks for your question. I'd be happy to take it as a follow-up item and, and post it maybe in the community afterwards um, to, to answer for everyone. And then looking down through here, it looks like um, how does one change or influence, influence rich snippets in Google search results? So what, what Stephen meant by that is if I go back to the example of where I talked about reviews, and if, let me let me see if I can find that particular slide, just so everybody knows what a rich snippet is. So, so on this slide here for online reviews, the stars that you see for the Google Plus reviews, those are something called rich snippets. Um, and so, the the, the answer to, to influence this is obviously to get more Google Plus reviews, and um, the, the quality of reviews obviously show up here too. If people give you one star or two star, that that's going to hurt your overall um, review and, and and the number of stars people see. So if, if Stephen and maybe you can chat in if you're still online, what what specific rich snippets? If, if there were others that you were referring to, but to influence this, I, I think that number one, you, I mean, part of this comes back to a good experience that they have with your organization. If they're adopting an animal somebody stayed at the hospital, if, if they stayed in your um, facilities, whatever it is that your organization does, um, it has to be it has to be a good experience. But you also as they're as they're finishing up, as they're leaving, uh, and we talked about this with Daniel Stobic at Botanical Gardens, a way that as they leave the garden that we, we give them um, some kind of business card or, or some kind of uh, little piece of paper or flyer or something asking them to to give a positive review. And and it, it's thinking about, okay, the, the touch points we have with our constituents and whether it's at events or whether whatever it is, when they use our services, um, how do we follow up with them? What kind of communications do we have? Do we ask them to review us? And, and you know, because oftentimes reviews, you, you know, you may just hear from people who are not happy with you and they, they go online and they, they review you. But if you proactively ask your um, visitors and, and the people that, that you service to review you, then, then you're going you're gonna to hopefully get more reviews and you're hopefully going to get more positive reviews as well. There, there's some other rich snippets that um, uh, some that were in there. Okay, and actually let me just read Stephen's reply here just to give a little more context right now when you search for our organization page. Um, oh, a oh, great question. So, um, and, and Stephen, I think what you're saying is when you search for your organization name, sometimes you, the name of your, your your homepage will appear, but sometimes below it there's something called site links where maybe six additional pages on your site will appear. And, and I think what you're saying is in your case it's the About Us page, the Contact Us page, the Donate page automatically shows, and you want to control and influence which pages show. Um, exactly. Okay, great. So this is something you can do through what used to be called Google Webmaster Tools and is now called Google Search Council. What you can do in there, and these, what, Stephen, what you're referring to, they're called site links. And, and it's, it's where Google just randomly picks six popular pages from your site and it lists it below the main listing, the main home page when, when somebody searches for the name of your organization. In, in Google Webmaster Tools, or now called Google Search Console, you can go in there and you can, you can remove pages that you do not want to appear in the site links. It doesn't exactly let you pick which six that you want to appear, but it lets you 
kind of kind of demote or remove which pages you do not want to appear. So in your case, if you did not want, say, about us for some reason to, to not appear, you could go remove that in Google Search Console and it would it would have some other page show up and then if you didn't like that page you could go in and remove that one as well and keep going and playing that game until you eventually get pages that, that you do like. Mike, uh, quick, uh, there's a great little segue there for me to just chime in. <clears throat> if Mike's got a few more minutes, we, we can certainly stick around by just paying attention to the clock. I know some of you might uh, need to head out, and if you are headed out, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Um, I am going to go ahead 